Now, what place is this? Because as we continue this passage, I just want to describe Ephesus a little bit for you. Ephesus had about 100,000 people. You know, that's roughly about half of the population of this city. And there was a big temple, a temple to the goddess Artemis, also known as Diana. And it was a little bit larger than a football field. So I want you to imagine the stadium downtown. Now, this temple was dedicated to a goddess named Artemis. Now, what's interesting about Artemis, or Diana, is that she had no male counterpart. She was, according to the mythology, a virgin goddess, had no relationship with men. Now, you can imagine where this is going. Then the followers of the goddess Artemis, they would end up being women in leadership and not marrying and not having relationships with men. And then you can imagine that sort of society infiltrating the church. And here you've got this young pastor, Timothy, and he's watching the women roll in. The women who have been tutored in this doctrine, this, these belief systems about the goddess Artemis and how women should lead society and how women should not get married and how women should not have children. And you can see then why Paul is writing this young pastor trying to strengthen him and encourage him and help him navigate these weird times. Because if he's not careful, he could be overrun by the beliefs of this cult. And so that, that's where we are here. This building was one of the largest, this temple, one of the largest in all of the Greek world. Uh, it was four times larger than the Parthenon. That's how big it is. It's known, it was known as one of the seven wonders of the world. You can see the ruins today in Ephesus. It was made of solid marble. It was a magnificent structure dedicated to women being the leaders of society, exercising authority over men, and not marrying in order to remain independent. Now, with that in mind, Paul is going to help Timothy understand what to do about all this. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. Now, you can imagine what the early women's liberation movement might have done with clothing, if there was any. There was, but it was indiscreet according to the culture of that time. And so he's saying, let's adorn ourselves, women, with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair. We'll talk about that in a minute, and we're going to let down those braids, everybody. (laughs) And gold or pearls or costly garments. Now, braided hair for us, I mean, come on. Are you talking Laura Ingalls Wilder here? That is some wild wilder. I mean, (laughs) Laura Ingalls Wilder with her braided hair from Little House on the Prairie, that is not risque today, is it? But back in the day, braided hair, maybe, just maybe, it was kind of like if you saw somebody in a miniskirt with a fishnet stocking slinging their purse on the street corner like this, right? (laughs) I do that pretty good, don't I? (laughs) But I mean... That sort of uh, impression was the one given by braided hair. And so we could get all hung up on the words of this, or we could see the attitude of this. We could go, oh, I got a gold watch. Oh, I got a silver ring. Oh, I went to Walmart and I've got cubic zirconia. I got to get rid of that. We could do that. Or we could see culturally... What is the spirit of what he's saying? Is there something sinful about a braid in the hair? No, it's the impression that's given. And so what he's saying here is to this young pastor, Timothy, let's not, let's not have the women in the congregation who've been influenced by this cult, this early women's live movement, to come in and push the idea that they need to carry themselves in this inappropriate manner to declare their freedom. Instead, let's be modest. Could this go for men also? Well, sure, if there were a problem with the men and their attire, certainly 
Paul would have addressed that. In the city of Corinth, he addressed men and women. He addressed men who were prophets, women who were prophesying, uh, tongue speakers who were men and likely women also. I mean, it's not a gender thing. It's an appropriateness thing. And these happened to be women who were acting inappropriately. But rather, not by your outward appearance, but by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. In other words, you're in Christ. You call yourself the righteousness of God. You call yourself holy and righteous and blameless. Well then, don't dress like a woman of the night. How about you carry yourself with some respect? So this is esteeming the woman, not belittling her. Let's say, if you're the righteousness of God, how about we all act like it? How about we all carry ourselves like we're the righteousness of God? Is this legalism? No, this is walking in a manner that is worthy of your calling. This is doing what is fitting for saints. Amen? Let's get rid of those braids. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. And we close the book. And we walk away and everything should be fine, right? Everything should be good. There's no context here. There's no history here to worry about, right? Let's make sure all women in all church buildings are completely silent. Now, how's that going? That was never his intent. Remember, there's a context here. If you go to the passage in 1 Corinthians about prophets, Paul is saying women prophesy in church. He is saying that women speak in church. They just need to do it without inappropriate hairstyles in Corinth. But he's saying they prophesy. He doesn't cut off the ministry. He's just saying don't cut off the hair. Because when you get the buzz cut, it makes you look like a prostitute in the city of Corinth. And so, what does this mean? Well, we've already seen who Timothy is overrun with. There are beliefs here. Not just women. There are beliefs coming along with these women And they need to stop it. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Again, this is, let me say it loudly and clearly, this is situational in Ephesus. You say, Andrew, how can you say that? How can you claim that? Here's how. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. God tells us, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Acts chapter 18, verse 26, a woman named Priscilla is mentioned first by Luke, and she is called a great teacher of the gospel who clarifies the truths of God's word. Romans chapter 16, verse 1, a woman named Phoebe is a deaconess, and she's serving as a leader in the church and a communicator of the gospel message. In Romans chapter 16, that same chapter, a woman named Junia is an early Christian who is helping people come to know the truth. In Acts chapter 16, there's a woman named Lydia who's a businesswoman, opens her home and hosts a home group or home church in her house. And last but not least, let us not forget 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where women are speaking and they're not told to shut up. Women are speaking, and they're simply told to do it appropriately, just like the other prophets and just like the tongue speakers, to do it in an orderly manner. So you say, Paul, what do you mean here? Well, here he goes, and we'll finish with this. These last few verses, they just make it crystal clear. Why are you telling us Adam was created first and then Eve? Guess what the cult taught? Guess what the heresy taught? They taught that Eve was created first and Adam was created second. Next, we see it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was being deceived and she fell into transgression. Guess what the cult taught? Guess what the heresy taught? They taught that Adam was the foolish one, that he was deceived, and that Eve never had a problem. That it was all Adam, not Eve, and that Eve was smarter than Adam, and women are smarter than men, so therefore women should lead society. Paul is clearing that up. And now, 
Here's an interesting one. What in the world is going on here? Women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. What in the world is this verse even doing here? I'm telling you, it makes no sense unless you understand the cult. Because the cult was saying women shouldn't bother with bearing children. They should lead independent lives, not marry, not get connected with a man, not have a family. It's a total waste. So Paul is clearing up three different things. He's saying, women, stop teaching this heresy. Stop teaching this heresy. And stop teaching this heresy. Adam was created first. Eve was created second. Eve was deceived. She wasn't perfect in this. And lastly, families are great and kids are wonderful. And go ahead and invest in family life. Stop teaching this heresy. You women remain silent. It's a situation. There's a context. What does God think about women? Well, elsewhere we're told there's neither man nor woman. We are all one in Jesus Christ. 